What is going on guys? Today we're going to be installing a water pump and thermostat on a 2010 Mazda 3. Now I don't have any codes being thrown for a water pump or a thermostat, but I do have 171,000 original miles on the car and typically water pumps last about 100k and on this car in particular they kind of fail at around 170 to or maybe 160 to about 200, 230,000 miles. So I'm right in that sweet spot when these fail and I'd rather that not happen and overheat the engine when I'm driving when I can just replace them. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Now, before we get into the installation, I just wanna show you the specific parts that we need as this is very important that you order the right stuff as to not have to do this again or it fail and ruin your car. Now, in regards to the water pump, what I have here is the ASIN and you can see it is part number WPZ743. Hopefully that loads on here. And this is an ASIN water pump. Now I know this is not the OEM water pump, but ASIN is an incredibly good manufacturer of water pumps. Reason being is they actually are some of the OE providers where they make water pumps for Toyota and a couple of other manufacturers, which is why I really trust them. And you can see this is exactly what the part looks like here. This is the ASIN water pump for the 2010 Mazda 3. And then as for the thermostat, I don't trust any other aftermarket brands like Dorman or Gates or Beck and Arnley. I don't trust any of those. So what we're using is an OEM Mazda thermostat. And this is what the thermostat pump looks like. The reason we're replacing both is because they're right next to each other. And if you have all the coolant drained out of your car, you might as well replace both. The part number for this thermostat right here that loads LF7015170 and this is a Mazda genuine part, which is also super cool. So with that being said, let's start uh, prepping the car for installation. So for those curious where the water pump and thermostat is, your water pump is right here. It's actually on the serpentine belt and it's one below it. It's the second one down here, right where those three bolts are. You can see right here is your actual water pump and we have to take this kind of uh, belt off too, as well as what it's sitting on. And then your thermostat you can see is right over here where my finger is. We got some hoses connected to it. We're going to have to pull that. We're going to have to take this belt tensioner off to be able to access that. And the reason I'm showing you this now is you can see on my car, uh, we got some rust in the engine bay. Now, because it's in the engine bay, we should be okay for a little bit, but keep in mind, you know, it's not as bad as things underneath, but we want to get rid of this corrosion. I'm going to put some penetrating oil, some penetrating lubricant like WD-40 on all the bolts that we're going to have to take off just to prevent, you know, snapping. I don't even want to say it around here, but that's what we're gonna do now really quickly. After lubricating the accessible bolts, I jacked up the car from the subframe. This way I could put jack stands on either side of the car and I used two jack stands on either side for safety. Then we need to remove the under tray so we can drain the coolant out. There's a few clips and bolts that you'll need to take off. And in my case, also a few zip ties. So with the belly pan off, the next thing we're gonna have to do is drain the coolant. So you're gonna need something like this, and I'm gonna show you where you can drain it from the radiator. If you go all the way under the car, you can see right here, there's a little plug in here, and you can unscrew that with a flathead screwdriver you can see in there. And that's what we're gonna have to unscrew, and all the coolant will drain out. Make sure to prep the area really well because the coolant likes to come out fast. Once it's unscrewed enough, just take off the overflow cap and it will all start pouring out. Well, I made an absolute mess on the garage floor, so I'm gonna have to clean that before we do anything else. But turns out if you remove that full stopper and then the second you unscrew the overflow tank cap. The second you crack that and you allow air to come in, this thing just squirts out like you saw and it went everywhere. You're gonna get about a gallon of fluid. Uh, there's more in the engine, but you only get a gallon from the radiator and everything else. We'll get a little more when we pull the water pump. Uh, that's why you also need to have coolant. We have coolant over here, you can see Asian vehicle, Presto, and we got Xerox. Either one works, uh, just make sure it's the correct one. These are already pre-diluted here, so we're gonna use either one of these. All right, so my mess is cleaned up. Just remember, it's very important to tighten back up that drain bolt, because when we pour new coolant in it, you don't want it rushing out of the bottom. And also remember to just tighten back up your radiator, uh, the uh, overflow cap. This way, when we unplug the water pump, we can hopefully reduce 
the amount of coolant that comes out of it. With the accessory belt still on the car, I loosened the three bolts holding the pulley onto the water pump. I used a big pry bar to stop the pulley from moving. A long screwdriver should also work. If there's still not enough room though, you can always support the engine and remove the motor mount to create enough space. So some of you guys be wondering what magic I just did to unscrew those three bolts that hold the top part onto the water pump itself. And there's tons of different ways online. If you've ever watched uh, other videos of how to remove a water pump here, some people remove the engine mount here and then they drop the engine so they can access it from underneath. You don't have to do that. Some people even put a chain around there, hold it tight. You don't have to do that either. All you really need is just two things. You need to get some sort of pry bar. I actually got these at Walmart. You guys might think this is crazy. Hyper tough has made and USA uh, pry bars from Weld, I believe is the manufacturer. And then you, this is a lifesaver. I love this tool. This is the Astro extended wrench right here with the nano sockets using a 10 mil. I was able to just lightly put this in here and give it a quick turn because I don't want to back this into the, the frame right here. That'd be tar horrible. We're just cracking it loose and we'll unscrew that later because we just need to unscrew them. And then we can take this uh, belt tensioner off. To remove the belt from the belt, tensioner, I used a 14 millimeter socket on a breaker bar. This way I have a place to slide the belt onto when I loosen the tension. To remove the belt tensioner, there are just three 12 millimeter screws you need to remove and then the tensioner should just come right off. This is also a good time to inspect your pulley and make sure that there's no play or noise coming from that too as it's easy to replace. With the belt tension removed, we finally have access to remove the top part of the water pump, as well as we have finally freed up access to the thermostat housing, which is right over here. So while everything's free, let's WD-40 these screws, let them sit, and then we'll start working on this part of the water pump. With the bolts already pre-loosened, you should be able to use your fingers or a wrench to take the three bolts out. So you can see the water pump just down there on the left and you can see we have access to the one bolt over there and there's one on either side. Just for reference here, this is gonna be where those bolts are. So we have one right where you can see it, one underneath and then one on the side. We get those three out and we should be good to go. The top two bolts are the easiest to get to from the top of the car. As for the last one, I found it easier to access it from underneath. Once all three bolts are out, I just used a pry bar to gently loosen the water pump out. It's in there pretty snug, so you might have to pull it and rock it from side to side. Now it's important that you put something underneath the car because coolant is going to come pouring out. Once it's out though, make sure to clean the mating surface from any debris, and you can even use a scotch bright for this if you want, and then it's time to reinstall it. With the old water pump finally removed, you can see here, it actually doesn't look really too bad, but I'd rather not wait for this to break, like I've said before. It's time to install the new one here. Now, in regards to lubricating this O-ring, it's pretty uh, safe to say whatever you're installing this into, like whatever liquid it is, that's what you should lubricate with. So because this is going into coolant, lubricate this with coolant and nothing else. If this was going into oil, you'd lubricate this with oil. So we're gonna lubricate this up, put it back in, tighten it down, torque it, and then we're gonna start working on that thermostat over there. It's crucial to thread everything hand tight first, and then once everything is seated, torque the bolts between eight and 11 Newton meters or 71 to 97 inch pounds. So 
So get this, I'm looking all over the place for the eight mil that we use to install the water pump. Can't find it anywhere. I just found it, you'd never guess where it is. So as you can see, it's nowhere here to be found, but check this out. We go under the car, right over there. There's my freaking eight mil socket, Jesus. Moving on to the thermostat, the first thing I did was remove the two hoses that connect to it. Using a pair of pliers, you can loosen the clips and slide them far enough away. And if you need help, you can get a pry bar or a screwdriver to help you loosen the actual hoses from the thermostat itself. Now, if you did the water pump first, then there really shouldn't be any coolant left to spill out of the hoses, which is good because the alternator is directly below it and you do not wanna get water on that. Now, if you're just doing the thermostat, then I highly recommend you put a bag over the alternator to keep it dry during this process. So with the two tubes removed, all we have left are three bolts. You can already see the top two. You can see one and then two right over there. And if we go underneath the car, because this is the easiest way to get it, the third bolt is right there. I just lubed it up. So let me get it out of the way. The third bolt, very easily accessible, is right over here. I believe it's also like an eight mil, and we'll just unscrew those. As you can see, I've already went ahead and WD-40'd it, so they should back out pretty easily. You can access the closest bolt very easily from the top. The other two though were a bit of a pain and I found it easier to remove it from under the car. I've also seen videos using an extension from the top which I wish I tried but you can always give that a go too. Alrighty guys, so we managed to remove the old thermostat right here. And you can actually hear it when I shake it, you don't hear anything. And with the new one, this is OEM, you actually hear a little, there's something shaking in there. And from researching this, I guess the new ones have kind of a bypass valve that uh, if the thermostat was to ever get stuck, it would allow coolant to still go through which is pretty unique, but uh, yeah, I'm exhausted, but I guess the last steps are putting this in. We got to torque it 70 to 100 inch pounds. It's gonna be really hard to do with the space that we have, so we might just have to do it by hand. It's not that hard to over tighten it, so you know, you can kind of sense how it felt coming off. That's, you know, that's the amount of pressure you're gonna need putting it on. But um, let's get this installed and let's put everything back together and add some coolant to the car because I'm exhausted. Doing everything in reverse, reinstall the new thermostat and again, tighten all the bolts first. This is to ensure that the gasket seats properly and to not cross thread anything. Try your best to torque it to spec. Otherwise, just tighten them by hand with a short ratchet because all you need is about five to seven foot pounds and that's very light. With the thermostat tightened down, slide the hoses back on and put the clips back in their place. Then add the pulley back onto the water pump, hand thread the bolts and use a pry bar to hold it steady while you tighten them down. You can also add some blue Loctite to keep them from backing out if you want to. Now these are torqued to 17 to 23 Newton meters or 13 to 16 foot pounds and do your best with this as you really can't fit a torque wrench in there. Lastly, reinstall the belt tensioner. I couldn't find a proper torque so just get them snug. Put the belt back on and you're done. guys, we have successfully reinstalled everything back into the engine bay. And all the bolts are back on, the serpentine belt is back on, so on and so forth. The next and last step is to just refill the car with coolant. 
As you can see here, I have Xerox Valvoline. This is the original green antifreeze coolant, 50-50. You can just check, I know this is the exact one, but I'm pretty sure it says Ma, uh, General Motors or Ford, because this is a Ford engine somewhere on there, but we're gonna refill it and then bleed the system of all the air. So we're gonna refill the car with coolant right now, still on jack stands. We're gonna check for leaks. If there are no leaks under the car, oops, we're gonna put the uh, belly pan back on, lower the car back down, turn on the car, crack open the overflow valve, and then we're gonna fill it the rest of the way with coolant and go from there. If you're wondering why I have a new shirt on, one of those coolant hoses, uh, I accidentally touched while it was under the car and it literally dumped coolant all over me. I wish I was filming it. Also, in regards to the belt tensioner, just tighten it hand tight, get it a little tight. Don't over tighten it or try to torque I'm just afraid you're gonna snap the bolt. Why? Because torquing it to 14 foot pounds snapped this bolt. So maybe I have the wrong torque for the belt tensioner. I don't know. Just do hand tight to avoid this. This was a pain in the ass getting this back out of the engine. So absolutely nuts. I will replace it and we'll be good to go. But, uh, and I won't drive it until then, but you know, just be prepared. Anywho, let's uh, refill the car with some fresh coolant. So quick update before I show you how to bleed the coolant system. I don't know if you heard, but when I originally started the car, there was a loud squealing sound coming from the engine bay. Turns out when I let go accidentally or when it slipped, Oops. this uh, belt tensioner when I was trying to put it back on, it actually messed up the inner bearing in the uh, this pulley here. Now, this is a left-hand turn pulley. I had to replace it. And I also replaced the bolt. You can see down there from, uh, I got it from Ace Hardware. Super cool. It's like three bucks for that bolt. Uh, turns out you don't want to over torque these things. I don't know if I have a bad torque wrench or anything. So I highly recommend just hand tightening these till they're snug. But in regards to this, this is a left-hand threaded bolt. So just righty tighty, instead of it being righty tighty, it's righty loosey to get that unscrewed. It's super easy. And then I was able to replace this with a Deco one, uh, which it's just good maintenance to do anyway here. But the part number is 89015. It was like $28 at Advanced Auto Parts and I got it the same day. So just an update, if you're doing that or you hear squealing, it's this. And uh, Mazda doesn't sell this piece separately and you can't replace this NSK bearing here that inside because it's pressed in and fused in with the plastic here. So you have to literally replace the whole thing aftermarket because Mazda only sells the entire belt tensioner, which is super annoying, but this fixed the problem. Just wanted to update you guys. Otherwise, let me show you how to actually bleed your coolant system. So when it comes to bleeding your coolant system, um, it's very easy, it's very straightforward, and it's not difficult. The first thing you wanna do is unscrew your overflow tank cap. Leave it off the car this entire process. The second thing you wanna do is fill it up with coolant. It, I lost about, I think, a full gallon of coolant even with the water pump being removed and draining the actual radiator. So expect to pour about a full thing of coolant. You might actually need two and you're gonna get just a little bit extra. So to play it safe, have two gallons of coolant. Then once it's at the max line in the tank, what you wanna do is actually go into your car and turn the heat all the way to the highest setting, but with the fan completely off. Then start your car with the overflow cap still off the coolant reservoir. And then you want to idle your car at about 2,500 RPMs. Hold it for about, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight minutes so that uh, the engine can get up to operating temp. Then go back outside, check your overflow and see where the coolant level is. If the coolant is gone, fill it back up. If the coolant is at the min line, Fill it back up to the max line and just leave it how it is. Uh, you want to make sure air doesn't burp out and you get too low. So go back outside, fill it back up. The next thing that you want to do is actually come back into the car and you want to turn your fan on high with the heat on high. And then yet again, put your foot on the gas and 
idle at about 2,500 RPMs. What this is going to do is eventually kick on the thermostat that we replaced, feel your heat coming out of your vents, and it should ideally get pretty hot when idling at 2,500 RPMs and get up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So feel it and make sure that hot air is blowing through your vents. And that's how you'll know that that thermostat gauge is open and allowing coolant to fully go through that heater core. Hold that RPM for about 2,500 RPMs yet again for five to maybe 10 minutes and then you're going to go back outside and check your reservoir again if it gets lower fill it up this time only to the minimum level or in between and that's it you should be good to go turn the car off go back outside check to make sure there's no leaks and the thermostat no leaks at the water pump put the overflow cap back on the reservoir and you should be good I'd say just as a last resort, what I like to do just for peace of mind is I actually have the coolant in the back of my car and um, the next drive or two, just go drive the car and sometimes the bumps of the road will actually help purge uh, any trapped air bubbles left and then let the car cool off. I'm talking about let it sit for at least an hour or two. Check the, the reservoir. If it's below min, just top it back off, but it should be about a gallon and a hair or more. Uh, a little over a gallon should be the max that you lose, and you should be good to go. Just check it the next couple of days and you're all set, and it's that simple. But otherwise, guys, that is gonna be it for today's video. If you like this type of content, then definitely make sure to smash the like button, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel, and remember, if you wanna learn also how to replace wheel bearings, front or rear, on the back or front of your Mazda 3 2010, then uh, make sure to check the video right after this. Pull me closer